where that same word kurios is used in reference to Jesus, it's not translated the same way. The same word, same Greek word kurios, when it applies to God, they translate it Jehovah. When it applies to Jesus, they don't translate it as that because they can't say that Jesus is Jehovah. That would go against their doctrine. There are over 400 references in the Greek New Testament that that applies to. So it's not just one or two verses out there. Over 400 of them where they don't translate the word kurios as God when it focuses on Jesus Christ. They've changed it to support their doctrine that Jesus is not God. And you say, well, maybe they just had a slip up. Maybe that was an error. Well, let's look at John 1.1. 1, 1. John 1.1 1, 1 says this. In our Bibles, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word. Well, they insert one letter in Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. I could read it right out of this Bible to you this morning. They inserted the word A. And here's what their version says. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Not the God, but a God. One of many. That's what they did. They changed it to fit their doctrine because they don't believe that Jesus is God. Let me give you another example. There are dozens of them. John 8, 58. In John 8, 58, Jesus says, Before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. I am is the name of God, Jehovah, Yahweh, in the Old Testament. When he spoke to Moses from the burning bush, and Moses said, Well, whom shall I say sent me? And God said, I am. That's the eternal name of God. He's not I was or I will be, but I am. And Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. Which means Jesus is God, the very God. He is the great I am. But they've changed it around. And here's what they say in their version, the New World Translation. Before Abraham came into existence, you have been. They changed the words that Jesus said. And instead of saying, before Abraham was, I am, I'm God, they changed it to this. Before Abraham came into existence, you've been. They put the focus on the Father and not on Jesus. Titus 2.13, our Bible says, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's talking about Jesus. They changed that because they don't believe that. Here's what they say. While we wait for the happy hope and glorious manifestation of the great God and of the Savior of us, Christ Jesus. Did you catch that? They've taken it from being one person, our God and our Savior, Jesus, to two people, our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Why? Because they changed the Bible. They altered the Word of God to suit their doctrine. Instead of letting the Bible change them, they changed it. And that's where they're in error. Here's another problem they have. Salvation. They basically believe in two groups of people. One's called the anointed class. That's 144,000 who were saved before 1935. And they started out saying that's all that would be saved. They had to change their doctrine because the ranks filled up. And there were a lot more Jehovah's Witnesses than places in heaven, more than 144,000. This is called the little flock. These are the people who went to heaven, and they're living in heaven. The place is already filled. Sorry, no vacancy. Nobody else can go. You say, well, I want to become a Jehovah's Witness so I can go to heaven. Impossible. Can't do it. Places are already filled. No vacancy there. 144,000, that's it. It's cut off. Well, what about all the other Jehovah's Witnesses? They become a part of the earthly class. The earthly class, and that's called the other sheep. Little flock, 144,000, other sheep, the earthly class. And these are folks that were saved after 1935, according to Jehovah's Witness doctrine. And they will not go to heaven because it's full, but they will dwell on paradise, a new, revitalized, perfect earth. What they say is that Jesus Christ didn't die for everybody. Literally, they'll say that. He died for these two classes, and that's it. He died for the anointed class, and he died for the earthly class, but for nobody else. What happens to people who die lost? They just disintegrate. They perish. That's it. You go to the grave, and that's all. You never have life after that. They believe in soul sleep and a lot of other things that are really weird and strange. They also teach that you have to be saved by good works. That's why they come out knocking on your doors. Listen to this. To receive everlasting life, direct quote, to receive everlasting life in the earthly paradise. Can't go to heaven, but on the earthly paradise. We must identify that organization. That would be Brooklyn, New York, and the headquarters of the Watchtower Society, and serve God as part of it. Serve God as part of it. Salvation's a problem. 
We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. We're saved to work, but we're not saved by our works. We work not in order to be saved, but because we are saved. It's a whole different mindset. But they have a salvation based on works. One other problem, real quickly. Jehovah's Witnesses are date setters. They have set dates over and over and over again. I love to talk to them about date setting when they come to my door. Because there's no way out of this, folks. Jehovah's Witnesses said, first of all, that Jesus Christ had come back in 1799. I hope not, because this is not much of a millennial kingdom, with all due respect. If Jesus came back, man, I'm missing something. 1799. Well, they decided to change that, which indicates there's a problem with it. 1874. Let's try that. 1874. That's when Jesus is going to come back and history will be over. Well, that didn't work out, so let's change it to 1914. 1914. That's when Jesus Christ is coming back. That didn't work out so well. Let's try 1925. And they just keep going on and on and on. In fact, in 1975, they said that human history would come to an end. You think it did? I think history is still going on. I think they missed it. I think they missed it altogether. Now, for a Jehovah's Witness, Jesus Christ is not coming again. He's already come. Here's what they say. Here's what they'll tell you at the door if you challenge them about 1914. They will say to you, well, something important did happen. World War I started. I don't know what that's got to do with Jesus coming back, but they'll say that. And then if you really pin them down, they will tell you the truth of what they believe. They believe that in 1914, Jesus came back spiritually, and now he's ruling and reigning through Watchtower headquarters from Brooklyn, New York. Folks, Jesus has already come. Aren't you glad to know that? Isn't that comforting that Jesus lives in New York? And he's ruling and reigning spiritually and visibly from the headquarters of the Watchtower Society. Literally, folks, these people believe that. I'm not making fun. I'm telling you the truth. Here's something else you need to know. When they knock on your door, ask them about the gospel or the Bible in stone. You know what they believe? Charles Taze Russell taught this for years up until his death in 1916. He said that the Great Pyramid in Egypt, the Great Pyramid, it was literally the gospel in stone the Bible in stone that you could walk through there and everything about that great pyramid underscored the teachings of the Bible. Well, guess what? In 1928, that was changed. Now, Russell died in 1916, so 12 years after his death, 1928, it was changed. No longer is it the Bible in stone. Now it's called Satan's Bible because they misunderstood what it really represented. Now, if they thought it was the Bible in stone, and now all of a sudden they realize it's Satan's Bible and a complete turnaround. How do we know they were correct on anything else that this man said? Ask them about the Bible in stone when they knock on your door and see if they know what you're talking about. One last thing, and I've got to hurry just a little bit. It helps to know also to answer these questions I posed earlier, what I call the horror of the New World Translation. And I deliberately use that word horror. The New World Translation and Jehovah's Witnesses are deceiving millions of people. And I can't think of anything more horrible. I can't think of a greater horror than thinking that you're saved, that you're all right with God, and when you die, you realize you believed a lie. That's got to be a horror. That's got to be the horror of all horrors. And yet there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people in the kingdom hall who are being deceived by this New World Translation and the false teaching of that cult. Let me give you some quotes real quick. Dr. Harold Rowley said this, quote, From beginning to end, this volume is a shining example of how the Bible should not be translated. Dr. William Barclay, great Baptist theologian of the past, quote, It is abundantly clear that a sect which can translate the New Testament like this is intellectually dishonest. That's what Barclay said. Dr. Bruce Metzger, he's a Greek scholar. He identified instances where the translation has been written to support doctrine without Greek approval. And he says this, several erroneous renderings of the Greek are found in this book. That's what these guys say. You may ask, well, why would intelligent, otherwise smart people believe stuff like this? Well, number one, I think they believe that because they're not aware of the history. They're not aware because in Kingdom Hall, they don't talk about Charles Taze Russell the way I've presented him this morning. 
And they keep a lot of that history under wraps. And they're taught not to read any other literature outside of their own literature because it will be negative. And they're told not to read any of it. So therefore, they're keeping their blinders on concerning these things that I've shared with this morning. Other people who are in the Jehovah's Witness organization come out of mainline denominations like Baptist, and they really aren't rooted and grounded soundly in the Word of God and good, solid Bible doctrine. Jehovah's Witnesses are trained to challenge people like that. And when they knock on the door and they find a church member who doesn't really know what they believe or why they believe it, it's a red-letter day. A red-letter day. They are persistent. They are aggressive. They ask questions. They don't mind proselytizing people from other denominations and other backgrounds. People will begin to question, if you listen to them long enough, what they believe and why they believe it. And they can rope people in if they're not solidly Rooted and grounded. Let me read you what one guy said, W.J. Schnell. He's a former Jehovah's Witness. He wrote a book called 30 Years a Watchtower Slave. And here's what he says, quote, The Watchtower leadership sensed that within the midst of Christendom were millions of professing Christians who were not well grounded in the truths once delivered to the saints and who would rather easily be pried loose from the churches and led into a new and revitalized Watchtower organization. The society calculated, and that rightly, that this lack of proper knowledge of God and the widespread acceptance of half-truths would yield vast masses of men and women if the whole matter were wisely attacked, the attack sustained and the results contained, and then reused in an ever-widening circle. You know what he's saying? When we knock on doors and find people who aren't rooted and grounded in the Word of God, they don't know what they believe or why, that's our target. Those guys, those people become easy prey. Now, to help them with their efforts, they print a ton of literature. You know that. The Watchtower magazine is published bi-monthly, and there are over 25 million copies, 25 million, when they're printed and handed out. Also, on top of that, the Jehovah's Witnesses have produced more than 1 billion Bibles and tracts and pamphlets and booklets since 1920. Every member is a missionary. And they just don't say that. They require it. Every member is a missionary. And Jehovah's Witnesses give, listen to this, between 15 and 50 hours per week knocking on doors. Every one of them. 15 minimum. 15 hours a week up to 50 hours a week knocking on doors. Why are they doing it? Because they have to work for the headquarters in order to earn their salvation. Now just think what would happen if we had... Just half of our church spend that low end, 15 hours a week, knocking on doors and telling people about Jesus. Can you imagine the impact? They're spending 15 to 50 hours with a false truth. And we've got the genuine article. Just imagine what would happen. Well, Pastor, what should we do? Well, number one, I think we need to pray for anybody we know who's a Jehovah's Witness. They're deceived. It's going to be a horrible day when they stand before God one day thinking everything's okay and they find out this book is a book of lies, the New World Translation. I want to tell you, that's a horrible thing to think about. Let's pray for them. Another thing we need to do, make a commitment ourselves to be rooted and grounded in God's Word, to be a student of God's Word. If you're not in a small group, I want to encourage you, find one this morning and get involved in a Sunday school class where you can make friendships and relationships and where you can be taught the word of God one-on-one you can ask questions and you can get answers it's a great thing it's a discipleship class and you need to find one if you need directions let us know we'll point one out to you we'll make sure you get there we'll escort you there we'll make sure you find a small group every Christian needs a worship service every Christian needs a small group and every Christian needs a place of service that's true every one of us And you need to be in Sunday school rooted and grounded in truth. Also, one last thing. If you've never been saved, if you've never accepted Christ, if you've never embraced Him as your Lord and Savior, you need to do that. And then when they knock on your door, you can say, I've given my heart to Christ. I believe He's God in human flesh. He came and died on the cross for my sins and was resurrected on the third day, and He lives in my heart. You know what they're going to say? Adios. Because they don't believe any of that. None of it. Have a testimony for Christ. 
If you've never prayed, you can do that right where you're seated this morning. Just say, dear God, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me. I repent of all my sins before you.